In the 1970s, rock and roll meant Led Zeppelin. They mixed hard rock with the blues to create the most thunderous sound on earth. Zeppelin could sell a stadium's worth of tickets within hours, and the charts were barely big enough to hold all their best-selling albums. In New York, the only people that could go across red stoplights was the president, the vice president, and Zeppelin at the time. You know, and I think that says it all. I mean, in America, they was. Massive. But Zeppelin could never have conquered the globe without the foresight and commitment of their manager, Peter Grant. No one could approach Led Zeppelin without talking to Peter Grant. And as the group became the most powerful group in the world, consequently Peter Grant became the most powerful manager in the world. Grant believed that nothing was more important than the musicians and he insisted that they were paid what they were owed. He forced executives and concert promoters to play by his rules, and he never took no for an answer. Earlier managers like Colonel Tom Parker viewed their artists as commodities to be bartered for sacks of loot. Grant treated his artists like royalty. When he died in 1995, he was acknowledged as one of the greatest names in rock management. He didn't see it as the manager and the act. He saw it as us sort of versus them. Peter put his artists on a pedestal. Uh, their word, their wish, their music, the way they wanted to play it, that was the most important thing in his life. He always used to say to me, you know, at the end, you've got to believe in your act because, you know, he said, if I was on an Earl's Court, who'd come and see me? My relatives, and they'd want to get in for nothing. Now when I was a little boy, at the age of five... Grant was brought up by his mother in South London. Money was tight and his childhood was tough. It made Peter understand that if he wanted a future, he would have to build one for himself. He started off work when he was 14 years old. He never did anything at school, he was never an academic. And on his school report, headmaster said, this man will never make anything of his life, he's useless, he's hopeless. And I think just that one little thing that horrible headmaster put on his school report gave him the incentive to say, right, well, you know, sod you, I'm going to do something. Peter got his first toehold in show business in a wrestling ring, a place where size mattered. Peter Grant and I used to do a little bit of work for a wrestling promotion company. That's where we first met. You know, we were young kids in those days, we were younger, and constructing the, the ring. And uh, the first wrestlers didn't turn up, and, and Peter Grant used to go in and do a bit of catch weight wrestling. Grant climbed into the ring under a variety of fanciful pseudonyms. Oh, the Masked Marauder. I thought he's the original Count Bartelli or someone like no, that. No, the Masked the the mask Marauder, that's who he was. He wrestled under the name of Count Mario Alessio of Milan, I think was his, was his name. He started off in life working for a carnival where uh, he would take on anybody in the audience. And he was, a, you know, he was a rough and tumble guy in the beginning. He was that guy that hung around fairgrounds in the 50s because that's where all gypsies and outlaws hung. And it was where things were loose and free. It's where the loosest girls possibly could be found. It was where a loose life could be had and one of great adventure going with that fairground from place to place. Grant's awesome bulk made him the perfect clubland bouncer. And he picked up spare cash as an outsized movie extra. He squeezed himself through the gates of Pinewood Studios to join a cast of thousands on Cleopatra. His looming figure even enabled him to stand in for Anthony Quinn in The Guns of Navarone. Two or three days as an extra in a movie, I mean, we all did that. 
we were all wanting to be in the music business, but to the music business at that particular time wasn't needing either Peter Grant or myself, so we had to occupy our time on, on doing other stuff. When Peter landed a job taking tickets at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, he found himself rubbing shoulders with the new faces bubbling up on the London pop circuit. He knew his casual jobs were leading nowhere. He became determined to muscle his way into the music business. He once told me that the, the reason he got into the music industry was because he owned a minibus. Started driving people around and somehow Don Arden or whoever heard he got a van and said, I've got a Gene Vincent tour coming up, will you drive him for three weeks? And that's what happened. Grant gained a crash course in rock and roll while working for manager Don Arden, the self-styled Al Capone of pop. Don specialised in bringing over American stars like Gene Vincent and Bo Diddley. He hired Peter as a tour manager. If there was a salary, a cheque to be collected, naturally I had to make him aware that sometimes the promise of the cheque was broken. And I gave him a list of people who were uh, good, genuine promoters and uh, a list of those who really weren't trusted. Don taught Peter that it was tough on the road, but business had to be taken care of. Meanwhile, Peter was soaking up lessons about stagecraft and showmanship. He learned how a show would work. He learned how you get an audience, how you hold back and then you deliver a decent encore, how you keep the lights on instead of having these floor managers say, all right, that's it, 10 o'clock, lights out, everybody's got to be out. You know, he was the guy that could hold that particular grubby little stage manager with one hand round his neck and hold the floor lights on with the other hand whilst the band played a rapturous encore. There is a house in New Orleans. When Arden sent Peter to the USA with the animals, he gave Grant his first glimpse of America's thrilling potential. It inspired Grant to start making independent plans. Arden was disgruntled by his burly employee's impudence. He got involved in unnecessary politics, and I saw from 3,000 miles away that he was drifting away from the Dunarden Enterprises. The Yardbirds! Grant was looking for a prestige act to manage, and he found it with the Yardbirds. He was developing his own philosophy, and he despised the traditional manager's role of the bully and exploiter. He believed his job was helping artists to maximise their potential. In those days, Everybody thought the artists worked for the manager. You know, in America it was like, oh, so-and-so, he owns them people. You don't own them. After all, they hire you, they give you a percentage of their money to do your very best for them. We did something like nine American tours or some phenomenal, you know, of tours that used to last for six to eight weeks. And it wasn't until Peter managed us that I, don't think, I think I ever came back with any money from an American tour. Grant understood how the American market worked. Other managers had come unstuck because they only knew the ground rules in Britain. Grant was a big man with a grand plan. He knew the richest pickings lay across the Atlantic. A lot of managers in those days didn't discuss money with their artists. Not necessarily because they were ripping them off or whatever, but they themselves were very naive. They didn't understand the business themselves, I mean, they didn't understand the, the way the Americans worked or the transportation costs or the, the taxes, the withholding taxes. I mean, even great managers like Brian Epstein, I suspect, 
you know, uh, and history has proved, made bad deals and uh, because they just didn't know. Now, Peter, uh, by the time he managed us, obviously there, it was a little bit more into the decade and he'd had a bit of experience and he was a sharp cookie. He was a street level sharp cookie, you know, and he had sussed a lot of that out. <laughs> Tour in America could be a hair-raising experience. Concert promoters were often armed and dangerous, but Grant answered their threats by becoming even bigger and more menacing. He drew on all his experiences as a wrestler, bouncer and actor to make sure his band got paid. And I said, well, I've come for the thousand dollars you owe me. And he said, you're not getting it. I said, well, you ain't leaving this caravan, pal, without you don't give me the thousand dollars. And he pulled this thing out and put this big revolver on there. You know, I said, I don't care what you've got, you've got to pay us that thousand dollars. He said, I'm going to shoot you. I said, I very much whether you're going to shoot me for a thousand dollars. I said, don't be so fucking cheap. Working with the Yardbirds was valuable experience for Grant, but the group was already in the process of falling apart. Back in London, guitarist Jimmy Page told Peter about his plans for a new band. He wanted Peter to be involved. I remember I was with him, we were driving down the Shaftesbury Avenue or somewhere one day and I said, what are you going to do, you know, you're going to go back to Sessions or form a new band? And he said, well, I'm going to get a new band together, will you help sort it out for us? And I said, fine. And that's how we started and what eventually, a bunch of musicians became Led Zeppelin. The new group was founded on the musical ideas of Jimmy Page and the business acumen of Peter Grant. In drummer John Bonham, singer Robert Plant and bassist John Paul Jones, Page assembled a formidable blend of talents. Grant never doubted the band's creative potential, while they appreciated having a tower of strength like Grant as their manager. You do the music and I'll take care of everything else. I'll take the record company, the promoters. I mean, that's what a manager does, but it really was that sort of division. Don't even think about anything else. I won't bother with anything else. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what you know, what, what's possible, what you can do, this sort of thing, but you just take care of the music, take care of the band, and you, know, you won't have to worry about anything. And that was it, and it was brilliant. Hey, we never had a contract with him. He reckoned that if we were fed up with each other, then we'd both find someone else. You know. What was the point? He was right. I don't know what it is about you that I like such a lot. Grant signed Led Zeppelin to Atlantic Records for a massive $200,000 advance. Peter wanted to be on Atlantic because he gave him access to the American market. He also liked being able to deal face to face with label boss Armin Ertiger. As for the band, they were thrilled by Atlantic's historic pedigree. We were basically known as an R&B pioneer label, but rock and roll was a direct outgrowth from the blues and from rhythm and blues and all those great English guitar players like Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page uh, were heavily, heavily influenced by the blues. <laughs> people like me now, you don't know who runs the company. Or maybe you do and, you're, and you know you're not worthy to go and uh, visit their offices. But he dealt very much with Armit. And Armit would then press the right buttons and things would happen. We did almost everything on a handshake. Uh, we would eventually formalize it by contract. But once we made a deal, verbal deal, that was a deal signed in blood. Everything gonna be all right this morning. He had this confidence, he exuded this confidence about, he knew he had the best band. And so all you gotta do is give me the best deal. And if you won't, somebody else will. You must have a tremendous, tremendous amount of attitude. Big, big time is attitude. You know, when managers come on heavy, people back off. 
I mean, I've seen Peter Grant because we used to share an office and he'd pick up the phone and I heard him say, million dollars, gut, piss off. And that was 30 years ago when a million dollars, not being flippant, but a million dollars was a serious amount of money. We have a lot of fun. When you're dealing with artists and musicians, you've got to be there 24 hours a day. You can't do it like you're selling, you're selling these glasses and at the end of the day you say, oh, fuck it, you know, you put it on the shelf and forget it. You know, tomorrow I'll sell 50 cases of glasses. You can't do that. You've got to be there for your artists. You've got to believe in your artists and you've got to be there for them. He lived and breathed, slept beside the band you know, and indulged in the same things they did. So he was, for all intents and purposes, part of the group. I remember when we first really done well. <laughs> I remember him embracing us all at once. <laughs> all four of us, he just stuck his arms around a lot of us. I think he may have even picked us off the floor. But uh, he was, you know, it was a very personal achievement when we did well. Grant's power sharing partnership with Led Zeppelin was a brilliant piece of strategy. It signalled the end of the old fashioned pop business, where artists were only good for a few hits and a quick fix of ready cash. In the 70s, artists' power would flourish. Grant and Zeppelin would lead the way. From the start, Peter used unorthodox techniques to crack America. He understood the way the rock market was changing in the US. In the early days, our audience felt themselves as not part of the, the pop buying public. It wasn't pop music, it was sort of more underground music. And especially in America, when it came at the birth of FM radio, which was FM underground radio, and it was a very exciting scene, and they really didn't want to have anything to do with top 40 music at all. No singles. And Armie Ertigan said, what do you mean no singles? No singles. And I decided that a whole lot of love should be the single. In fact, we actually released it. I get this call from uh, Peter Grant's office summoning me over to his building. So I go in there and I meet this guy. You know, he's a pretty daunting individual. He's six foot six inches tall. He's pretty big. And he says, I, I hear you've uh, released a single. I said, oh yeah, it's going really well. He said, I don't want it out. And of course, I said, wait a minute, I'm, you know, I'm with the record company, I kind of know what I'm doing here. You have to have a single, I mean, that's how we promote records. He said, not my records, you don't. The record company was exasperated by Peter's refusal to abide by the long established rules of promotion, but they couldn't argue with Zeppelin's success. To us, it was like, you know, taking away a very important tool in breaking a group. But we were not allowed to put out singles. Uh, he did not want them to appear on television, which made it also very tough to promote. I <laughs> got 5,000 radio stations driving them mad to put out a whole lot of love as a single. And they've got orders in for like 800,000 if they want it. And Peter Grant says, remember what I said, no singles. And he was right, because they sold 800,000 albums. Zeppelin mania began to engulf America, but Grant never forgot what he'd learned during his van driving days. He understood the importance of professionalism and putting on a spectacle. 
He turned down an appearance at the Woodstock Festival because he sensed the event would dwarf any individual band. He was brilliant in how to present the band and he'd say, don't do this, you know, don't do that. Or we ought to go here, but then we you know, won't go there and then, then we'll, now we'll go here and I think it's a good time for this. He, that was how he operated with us. Peter had total and utter control over the guys in terms of their emotions. He kept them very, very together, which was, I think, a, a feat, really, because when you walk on stage and there's 100,000 people out there going like this, I mean, you, you're 20 feet tall, I guess. Zeppelin were trampling all opposition underfoot. At one concert in 1973, they broke the US box office record previously held by the Beatles. Grant now had the leverage to rewrite the financial terms of the music industry in Led Zeppelin's favour. In the past, promoters had taken 40% of concert proceeds. Peter made them a new offer which they couldn't refuse. They were the established promoters, which had these, these funny rules that we get, you get 60, we get 40. And Peter said, no, you get 10 and we get 90. Or otherwise you don't get them. It was an outrageous uh, suggestion at the time. There was much yelling and screaming, but in fact, not only did, did most of the promoters accept those terms, because Zeppelin was a sure sellout, and therefore 10% of the profit was meaningful, but, but other stars followed suit, and that became the template of, of, of uh, most major artist concert deals. He basically um, changed it by making, for a moment, the band more important than the industry. Um, the band more important than the record company. He treated everybody else as parasites. Peter personally hunted down anyone trying to make a quick buck out of his band. Led Zeppelin's movie, The Song Remains the Same, showed Grant heaping humiliation on a promoter who'd allowed illicit merchandise to be sold at a Zeppelin show. Don't fucking talk to me, it's my bloody act. I did better leave you any time, you couldn't even get my starting line. You're going to tell me that you let... I bet it wouldn't happen in Europe I don't know how England. the guy got in the building. This isn't Europe or England. No, I can see the that because it's so inefficient. You've got to front them out with that terribly being British and the right verbal. And it's what I call verbal violence, you know. You don't actually say, I'm going to do this to you, but you intimidate them. That's, what, that's the game, intimidating them verbally. And I realised that if you were British, you could really do it because you could always out-verbal them any time you wanted to. You know, they have a great thing of calling you Palo. Listen, pal. I go, I'm not your pal. How dare you address me like that? Address me like that? I hardly know you, wretched little man. You know, and they think, fucking hell, what's that all about? They've never heard anything like it before. You had people inside this building selling posters and you didn't know anything about it. I didn't them. know about it. As soon as we found out about it, we stopped it. Yeah. As soon as we found out about it and told you... You stopped it. Right, so if you walk away and let them get away with it, they tell everybody else. Well, how much kickback were you getting? None. I knew nothing oh. about it. Right, then you're going to have, right, it's going to be a chain reaction. You're always going to have trouble. Once you establish that, people know not to fuck with you then. They know not to fuck with you. As so long as we screw an extra few bob out of the group, let's enjoy that. You're the fucking controller of the day, you silly, aren't you? Well, that's like saying that anybody who jumps on a stage, I'm responsible for it too. No, 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 of course it's no, your responsibility to see that the concessionaire and yeah, the building that you rented, right you rented it and you control it isn't selling fucking pirate posters. You have to somebody, have to somebody else to come and tell you that it's doing. Doesn't matter as long as there's an extra nickel to be drained by exploiting Led Zeppelin, it's great. You know, we never, we never with the fucking the stars and stripes behind it. Got to help me. I can't do it all by myself. You got to help me. Rock's biggest act suffered an epidemic of pirate recordings, and Led Zeppelin's epic concerts were a prime target. At a Zeppelin show, Grant was God. Not even city officials were safe from the rampaging manager when he was sniffing out audio pirates. 
He was in, I think, in Toronto. Uh, the, the band were playing, and he saw some guy holding up a, what he thought was a microphone, taping the show right in front of the speaker. So he goes up to this guy, and he says, what are you doing? And the bloke doesn't answer. So he asks him again, what are you doing? And the bloke just ignores him. So he got hold of him by collar and pants, took him to a stairwell, threw this equipment down the stairwell, and was just about to throw this guy down after it, when the hall manager came running up, and it turned out this guy was the environmental sound officer. Uh, and he was, Peter was promptly arrested. And the business as it was then, it was a lot different than what it was now. You had to use a reasonable amount of force or show people you weren't scared of them and you were going to get what you wanted at all costs. You got to help me, baby. In his younger days, he was a wrestler, and so he sort of perfected the technique of slapping you. And he could slap you quite hard around the edge, you know. And I've seen it happen a few times to people that um, deserved it. Yeah, and he didn't get on with. Why she may have to sew, I may have to cook. He went to this rugged shop and he asked, Do you the manager? The man said, Yes. He says, Do you have the bootleg record of Led Zeppelin? And the man said, Yes. And he reached under the table where they were hiding these illegal recordings and took them out and told them it was 30 pounds or whatever. And Peter said, You know, you're not supposed to sell these. And he grabbed this man's arm and he started to squeeze it and he said now you have to promise me not to sell any more of these or I'm not going to stop squeezing and the man was started to scream as Peter broke both the bones in his arm while squeezing it there was this sense that once you grabbed that ball and you were dictating terms to the, to the rest of the world's establishment and of an older culture, there was a sense that you felt immortal. He had this mythic character that there's no English record company could even begin to deal with. They were all like noddy people in Toyland in comparison to where Peter stood in the eyes of the United States because he did have, as Arm Ertigan must have known, the, the, the biggest and most significant rock and roll band in the world. As the 70s unfolded, the rock industry began to resemble a titanic arms race as supergroups slugged it out in super domes and stadiums. Grant's strategy had turned Led Zeppelin into the biggest money spinner of them all. Everything about Zeppelin was huge. Their sales, their reputation, even their manager. The band's behaviour became larger than life too. Grant's policy of keeping the press at arm's length stoked the band's mystique. If journalists didn't have the facts, they printed the myth. Stories of the group's hotel wrecking exploits in places like LA's Hyatt House define an entire era of rock star excess. I checked in to the Hyatt House, known affectionately as the Riot House, and as I was going up in the elevator, uh, the guy had, the, the, the bellman as they call them there, had pressed the wrong button. And we stopped on a particular floor and the doors automatically opened and the doorway had been boarded up with bits of wood. And I said to him, good heavens, I said, what happened here? Have you had an earthquake? He said, no, Led Zeppelin were here last week. Some is very near the truth and some is exaggerated and some is underplayed. But yes, we did have parties. With the band, like a musician, like they get up at midday or whatever time they get and the whole day is built up to like that eight o'clock and somebody says, the house lights go out. Boom, it's Led Zeppelin and the concert goes like that. So the whole day is a build from getting up. And you just can't go off at the end of the night, can you? And go get, you know, Agatha Christie out or something and read it. You can't do that. It was pretty commonplace amongst bands on the road. I'm surprised we got quite, I mean, the Who. The Who used to use explosives, you know. How, how do we get the, the, the rep? <laughs> Uh, it was pretty universal. <laughs> um, we were in pr some pretty awful hotels, to be honest. You never wreck a nice hotel. And after a while, it used to get so that the manager would actually put you in rooms that needed redecorating so that he would get them paid for. <laughs> 
John Bonham was Zeppelin's rowdiest demolition man. He got homesick and drank too much, then ran amok. Grant played Big Daddy and made sure all the damage was paid for. Bonham said he was on a rampage one day and he smashed everything. He even got the security into helping smash the pool table because he couldn't do it on his own. And, it, and the, um, you know, before we were checking out, they came up and the, and the guy happened to be English. And he's looking at all the damage, and he said to Bonzo, kind of looking down his nose at him very smugly, oh, you left the mirror. Bonzo said, oh, did I? I'm sorry about that. He took it off and smashed it straight in front of him. <laughs> you know, I mean, there was they were absolutely demolished if they were done, but I mean, it wasn't every night. Led Zeppelin left a trail of wreckage as they crisscrossed America like a marauding army. But their ability to live outside the law was a powerful element of their appeal. They acted out their audience's wildest fantasies. Even a wrecked hotel room seemed like a blow for freedom. When we went to pay the bill, the manager asked about all the damage. We said, well, just give us the bill for the damage. So we paid him for the damage, and he was like, he was like seething. And Peter said, look, you've been paid for the damage. He said, you know, what you, what's the big deal? And he said, it's not that. He said, it's just that you guys can do what you want. He said, you see, he said, I like working in this hotel. He said, I hate this. I'd love to do what you do. He said, pick a room and give me the bill. And he did, the guy went down, threw everything out the window, smashed the windows and gave us the bill. Peter got the cash out. That was it. <laughs> Have that one on me and off we went. The myth of Led Zeppelin was beginning to take on a life of its own. Jimmy Page's interest in the occult added a frisson of unholy magic. When Peter Grant returned home to his moated grange in Sussex, he brought the mysterious aura of Led Zeppelin with him. I remember the local taxi office would never come down to pick us up because they always said that um, we had crocodiles in the moat. And also some of the, the villages, they, they were a bit sort of um, chinny really ran. It was like a little sort of exclusive village. They always said that we uh, sacrificed babies. Uh, sacrificing of babies and crocodiles and, and it actually made you laugh. Well, obviously, because, I mean, no. no it was nothing further from the truth, really. Yeah. Of course, lunges, we lived in our own little sort of world and mum and dad had their great parties. You know, we had a medieval party once. We had jousting on the lawn and all, you know, the cider and all these big feasts and that. Dad used to invite the local vicar and get him pissed, you know. And <laughs> All the ladies from Mum's coffee mornings, you know. <laughs> you saw people in a totally different life. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't really care, you see. We didn't really care about what people thought of us. Mum and Dad didn't, and especially Dad didn't. Dad, didn't care. Dad never cared about what anybody thought of him. But the tension between keeping a Zeppelin juggernaut on the road and maintaining personal relationships was bound to cause casualties. One of them was Peter's marriage. Dad was determined, come hell or high water, to keep his children, no matter what it took. And yeah, yeah, we stayed, we stayed with Dad. And that was quite a sort of um, frightening thing, I think, for Dad to take on, because, like, all of a sudden, he's got to become sort of mum and dad together, you know, to look after us. But I think he did a fantastic job. And we really did, the three of us, we really stuck together, you know, and it, it sort of really proved that closeness that we'd always that we'd always had. It was difficult that when he went away, but he would always keep in contact with us. And before he used to go away, he used to give us all the night, you know, myself and Helen, he'd have an itinerary list. So we'd know where he was, each show he was going to, what time he, the show would finish, what time he was due back at the hotel. So we could always be in contact. He loved being at home, he loved the family life. When he actually had to go back, I think it wasn't a guilty thing, he just felt very sad. But at the same time, he had to work. He, he loved. He loved his job. He loved going away. Loved being around this whole the whole scene. And the Peter's guidance, Zeppelin had become the swaggering supermen of rock. But they would soon see the dark side of success. Professional strains and personal loss would test Grant's powers to the limit. <laughs>
the mid 1970s, Zeppelin and Smash box office records, released five multi million selling albums, and toured in their own Boeing 727. They decided to invest some of their snowballing wealth in their own record label. Swan Song would put out Zeppelin's albums as well as signing other acts, including The Pretty Things, Maggie Bell, and Bad Company. There was a trace of vanity in it. I mean, certainly it sounded better to say, gee, I have my own label than I'm on Atlantic, and the artwork was more uh, exotic, you know. Um, but at the same time, Bad Company's album went to number one and sold millions of records, so that was not mere vanity. That was a real success, um, and that's a band that today is still remembered, and, and their songs are still played on the radio. So they at least, they at least spawned one bona fide other star from from the bosom of Swan Song besides just Led Zeppelin's records and that differentiated it from the Jefferson Airplane label, the Grateful Dead label or even the Beatles label. Feel like making Artists signed to Swan Song and just found a record label, they got management by Peter Grant too. Grant tried to give his other artists the same artistic freedom and protection from corporate interference, which had worked so well for Led Zeppelin. Nobody said he was dodgy, but everybody said he was a bit sort of uh, to be feared and all that. But I always found him very, uh, very sort of um, father like, you know, very, very. I would imagine if, you, if he wasn't working for you, he could be quite fearsome, but. Uh, he was sort of very paternal towards us, our little band, you know. Coming from humble beginnings, he was always like protecting or looking out for the, the ordinary bloke, i.e. musicians like myself. He didn't feel any guilt about getting some mega deal for, for us, and I was like, how much, you know? Oh, well, they can afford it, you know. And uh, I told them they couldn't have Zeppelin if they didn't. From the shabbily appointed offices in London's King's Road, above the British Legion, Peter ran Swan Song with the help of his faithful squad of roadies and minders. He hated the idea of running a conventional record company. Later, he wondered if he should have been running one at all. As much as he loved Bad Company, and as much as he liked their music, I think, with hindsight, he felt that the record label was a mistake. And that's something, you know, everybody who gets into this game one of the driving forces is ego. I mean, probably a lot of the viewers of this will think it's money. It isn't. Money is the byproduct of what you do. Uh, what drives most people is ego. And once you are become a successful manager, you get all these aspirations to have empires and to be some sort of mogul or something, which is bollocks. Grant was born to be the manager of Led Zeppelin. Everything else proved to be a distraction. He could be unnecessarily confrontational uh, to his own detriment uh, when people, after a certain point, wanted Peter Grant to like them, wanted to be in business with him. But he wasn't an empire builder. He was a manager. And he really was driven by a particular sense of identification with his artists, particularly with Led Zeppelin. That's what he wanted to be, and that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he was good at. Grant had built Led Zeppelin's road crew into a tight little gang with a rough reputation, who sometimes got out of control. In California in 1977, Grant, John Bonham and two Zeppelin roadies were arrested after a security man had been beaten up. Sometimes they would all get out of hand, and sometimes Peter got out of hand too, and they had an altercation in San Francisco uh, involving uh, uh, Bill Graham which was unfortunate. It did get out of hand. There was a certain amount of bullying that went on that shouldn't have happened. And I'm sure that Peter, if he were here now, would, would really regret it. But nonetheless, it did take place. Uh, once again, possibly drug-induced some of the time. The paranoia thing that drugs cause maybe cause these extreme adverse reactions. The late 70s were turbulent times for Led Zeppelin. The punks derided them as bloated dinosaurs and long inactivity strained the band's personal relationships. In 1980, they roused themselves for their first major European tour for seven years. Then, all their plans were torpedoed by the death of John Bonham. 
the drummer choked in his sleep after another session of heavy drinking. Grant had grown especially close to Bonham. He was inconsolable. We were just rehearsing for a tour to go to America. I think tickets had been sold even. So whatever had gone on had been put aside and, you know, all ready to, ready to go again. It's kind of a clanned thing, you know. You're in the family or not. And once John passed away, nobody else could replace him. So there was no point in going any further now. And, and that was it. Which was a brave thing to be able to... In, most of we find another, not him. It was incomplete now. It was not just like a very dear friend that had died. It was like part of... He knew then, I think, when John had died, that a part of your life, his part of his... big part of his life had, had died as well. The house, which was quite fun and, and bright and breezy as such, um, was like a bit like a morgue, really, for, 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 for a little while. People were frightened to make any noises and mm. people were whispering rather than talking. And, that, and you didn't, you was like walking on eggshells, really, because, you know, you didn't know what to say just in case, you know, you said the wrong thing and, you know, and he would take it badly. He had this image of being this huge man that was fearless and all the other stuff that uh, built up his image, if you like. And, but there was, a, there was a very sensitive side to him and it really did have a, a tremendous effect on him. He became reclusive. Grant's relationship with Led Zeppelin went far beyond the merely professional. He felt as though his own family had been torn from him. It was a psychological blow which plunged him into a period of solitary despair. Even his closest friends couldn't reach him. He tried to numb the pain with drugs. I think by this point, and I know he wouldn't mind me saying this, um, I think the Peruvian marching powder was starting to get into the picture. And he literally, he pulled up the drawbridge. And he went into the house and for four years he stayed there and I'm afraid that the, the drugs took over. He sat in the house and the house started collapsing around him. The members of the band and also the members of Bad Company were having trouble getting a hold of him. And he was beginning to lose control of the musicians he was representing. And every time you called, there was always an excuse. One of the members of Bad Company said to me, uh, he must be the cleanest man in the world because every time I call, he's in the bathtub. <laughs> he was managing me for a while, but then I couldn't contact him at all for a while. Nobody could contact him, and so I kind of wrote him a letter saying, oh, I don't really think it's working out, and maybe another time, you know, maybe again, you know, do some work together, fine, and it kind of ended like that. Jimmy and Robert couldn't get him on the phone for weeks on end. I used to have to go down to Horse Lounge's manager and dial up Jimmy Page and say, hey, Peter, speak to Jimmy. That's how bad it got at, at one particular point. I used to go down to Marks and Spencer's every day and spend 50 or 60 quid on sandwiches and trifles. After a period of time, the manager used to come over and say hello to me and, uh, and said to me one day, what do you work at? And I just didn't have the art to turn it. I was buying it all for one guy, so I told him I worked for a children's home and they were treats. Well, they say he was well impressed about the manager, so, you know, every day he would carry my shopping hand to the car to make sure I didn't get a parking ticket and that, you know, I just didn't have the art to say to him that I'm, I'm buying 50 quid's worth of sandwiches and trifles for a couple of people at the manor house. The end of Led Zeppelin took away Peter's main purpose in life. For years he felt crushed by the loss, Swan Song disintegrated, and Grant's absence left his artist no choice but to seek guidance elsewhere. But eventually, daylight began to seep into Peter Grant's shadowy world. I think he just woke up one morning and thought, fuck this, you know, this is ridiculous, sitting here feeling sorry for myself, 
you know, it's life out there. I'm going to get on with it. And, and, you know, he just woke up one morning and thought, that's it, let's, you know, let's get out of this and start afresh. And that's what he did. And he pulled himself out, out of it, and he got his act together. I'm really proud of him for that, you know. He eventually kicked it. He just, he just flushed the... He, he told me that he locked himself in a room for three days with a flagon of orange juice. He flushed the drugs down the toilet and he stayed in there for four days doing cold turkey and he never touched a drug afterwards. And the roadie came up to him afterwards and said, Peter, if only you'd told me, I could have got you a refund. At last, he was able to accept that a chapter of his life had closed. The world was about to see a fitter, happier Peter Grant, who had abandoned his destructive rock and roll lifestyle and adopted a positive new outlook. He came to see me in my hotel, and when I saw him, I couldn't believe it was the same man. He must have lost 250 pounds, and he was dressed in a very well-cut suit with a, a smart necktie, and in a way I'd never seen him before. He looked like a banker. And uh, he was thoroughly, a thoroughly d different person, but still, he still had that marvelous glint in his eye and that very warm smile. I was pleased to see him um, come through that, you know. I think once he got over all that Zeppelin stuff, he, he, he sort of got on with it, you know. Come out of It's like mourning, you know, when somebody in your family dies, you sort of, you can't sort of deal with life and then you get over it in time and then you get to grips with it all and start again. A decisive break from the past, he moved from his gloomy mansion to the sea air and sedate pace of Eastbourne. He became quite a part of the local community. To his vast amusement, he was asked to, to become a magistrate, which I think he thought was, was somewhat ironic. I remember on one occasion he asked me if, he, if I would go along with him and judge a, a talent contest, in the, which was taking place in the pier just behind us. Grant felt no desire to return to the rock business. He had the time to indulge his love of classic cars, and he occasionally amused himself by pretending to be a chauffeur with his close friend, Lord John Gould. We go and do a few weddings together. They had no idea who was driving. And I remember the first wedding, we were sitting outside munching a sandwich uh, while they were getting married, and then we drove off. And after the wedding, we were paid 30 pounds each in cash. And I remember Peter saying to me, um, well, in, in his inimitable language, he said, oh, fucking hell, John, the first cash I've had for years. Lovely. My fondest memory, I think, is when the kids were born. I think seeing him with the grandchildren and you know, how he was with them was, you know, definitely keep saying this unselfish man had just wanted to please everybody else. Last time I spoke to me, he said, you know what I'm saying, Mick? I'm 60, you know that? I said, I'm amazed you got that far. He said, so am I. And he didn't get much further than that, did he? So maybe there was something about the cycle of life of completing it. And because uh, it, it, it has its... It wear and tear, it's tough out there for the manager. In my opinion, the worst job in the world. Peter died suddenly of a heart attack in 1995, aged 60. By the time of his death, he had become revered by a new generation of rock managers. He was often invited to music industry gatherings where he regaled his audience with tales from his rock and roll years. But the business Peter Grant had transformed had become a drabber place without him. There's too many people who are too, they're just too dull. They're almost repressed by the, the way that the industry's gone. It's become so bogged down in contracts and paper and lawyers and accountants. I know it's a cliche to say that, but it really is that way. And Peter now had, didn't have much time for that. He, he wanted to, you know, he wanted to get on the tour bus with his band, go somewhere, put on a great show, have a great time party a bit, make a few bob. More than a few bob. Now when I was a little boy, at the age of five, 
I had some in my pocket Keep a lot of folks alive Now I'm a man Made 21 You know, baby We can have a lot of fun <laughs> 